and I am helped. My heart ex- Once again, uh, good morning. Welcome here to Central Baptist Church. Again, I know a lot of folks just joined us live streaming, live Facebook. So, so glad that you're here. If you have a Bible with you or whether you're participating with us online, if you have a Bible, we'll have a phone with a Bible translation. Let's take it and turn to Colossians chapter 1. This morning, we're going to pick up in verse 21. Uh, The title of the message is The Story of Jesus. And we're going to talk about how uh, that He rescues us and how He rebuilds us. It's a great passage of Scripture. Now, before we do that, I want to make just a few uh, brief comments Uh, concerning something that took place on Friday. Most of you may be aware uh, there was a release by the Arkansas State Health Department uh, sometime late Friday afternoon. It was requested by media to release that, and it was uh, a statement or really a list, a PDF file, concerning uh, 40 churches. Central was one of them, and it had uh, a list of possible COVID exposure, uh, that kind of stuff like that. It was put out uh, on the uh, 6 o'clock news. Uh, I was not contacted beforehand by the Arkansas State Health Department. I was not contacted beforehand by KIT8. Uh, my phone went dead. Uh, I'm laughing because it's kind of funny now. It wasn't funny at the time. But my phone went dead. And uh, Angie, when she came out holding the phone up to me, I'm outside. I'm thinking, what just happened? She said, you need to take this phone call. She said, my phone is blowing up. Uh, it says there's an outbreak of COVID uh, going on at Central. And I'm like, what? And uh, I had no idea what was taking place or going on, so made a few phone calls the best I could. I did, uh, they did ask me, KIT8 called, said, we want to, we, we like, would like to have an interview with you with the producer, and I said, no. And I know it was posted later that Dr. Archie Mason said, no comment. I said, I'm not giving you an interview because I have no idea what is taking place right now. Until I have the facts, I'm not going to say anything to anybody, and I got to do some research. So I spent most of a Friday night and a lot of time yesterday going through what was happening, taking place. So I just want to share with you as a church family, uh, you need to know the State Health Department uh, returned my phone call Friday night, which very kind of surprised me. Uh, I had a phone call yesterday. They have been very good. They have worked with us uh, tremendously. And so I just want to say hats off. And I know a lot of people are watching this because they want to know exactly what I'm about to say. So here we go. Uh, here's what I've learned that I can share with you. If you go out, you or I go out, we're here today. We feel perfectly fine. We have no symptoms of COVID, and we go get tested on Wednesday, uh, and then it comes back. Then later, we'll see if it comes back positive, and we get a call from the health department later. They're going to ask a series of questions like, you know, what did you do? Where were you doing that infectious period? If you ever watch the governor's uh, daily briefing, we watch it every day. I was not in office on Friday, but we had one pastor assigned to watch it and to text me everything that he said uh, in that. We knew there was a chart of churches that went up on Friday uh, to some degree, uh, didn't give names specifically, but we knew that uh, particular. So if you go out and test positive, they're going to ask you a litany of questions like, where have you been? What restaurants? What gym? Did you go here? Did you go to a church? And if you see it every uh, day in the post, it say 2% of people tested positive, attended the church in the last seven, five days during the infectious period. Well, that list is a growing list, okay? And in that list, what that means, there's a disclaimer at the bottom of the PDF file composed of 40 churches that was requested by the media uh, that was sent out. They did talk with their lawyer on Friday afternoon at the State Health Department and considered the Freedom Information Act. But it had a disclaimer at the bottom that I do not believe was reported accurately. It said, this is for the duration of COVID. And it is a number that changes continually. It's for the duration of COVID through June the 25th. Here's what that means. I've had three definitions so far. That started in January. That started in March. That started the 1st of May. So if you go out, there's an accumulation list, a cumulative list with the State Health Department. And it's, hey, they're trying to mediate this, trying to stop it, trying to find out where transmissions occur. They probably asked you a question. Were you a part of a peaceful protest? Did you go to Memorial Day weekend party? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff like that that probably is asked. And then it's accumulated. So if you said you attended Central, Central Baptist Church, then they ask specific questions of that. 
Uh, did they have hand sanitizing stations? Did they have this? How did you do? Did you have social distancing? Uh, did you wear a mask? All that kind of stuff like that. Well, it's cumulative. So uh, when I spoke with the state health department, I said, I don't think you understand the damage that you just did to us. And they said, we're so sorry. That was not any intent. I said, well, I said, they asked me later, they said, How, what can we do to help? I said, the word cluster. I said, when you talk to a country boy like me and you say cluster, I, I don't know what that means. I'm thinking 25, 30 people. It's two. Two or more or less than 11. That's considered a cluster. I said, you may want to redefine that definition somewhat and help us out on that. Uh, I do think, let me state this, make these statements. There's no outbreak at Central. We've not been notified by the state health department before that went out. We have not been notified by anybody who has attended Central stating that they tested positive uh, with COVID at any time during the duration of the COVID outbreak from January, if it's March or it's May. We have no contact whatsoever. We had another request for an interview Friday that came. We want to talk to you about the COVID outbreak at Central. There is no outbreak at Central. I think it was unfair to post that list publicly, especially without contacting any churches and talking beforehand. So I think it's unfair to do that. I also think it's unfair because there's a list of businesses that are on there too. I think it's, they say it may be legal. I'm not 100% sure about that. To post that publicly and to put that out there. So I just want to share with you what has happened and what has taken place. I told the, the person that I said, uh, this has, the damage has been done to us in public opinion. And I said, I do not want this happening to anybody else in our community. So I just want you to know, uh, as your pastor, here's how I want to encourage you with this. Now, I had no comment on Friday night, but I'm not through commenting yet. So I am going to ask for a meeting, if it's by phone or whatever, with the governor. I, I love him, support him and that. I just want to encourage him, don't ever do something like this again. Uh, in our state. If you're for small businesses, this is not the way uh, to encourage them to help them. Now, I know as a pastor, I'm making statements there, people who disagree, whatever. That's just the position I'm in, okay? But I do want to encourage us. We can't control. I know we're concerned about what's going on in the nation, man. We got to pray. We got to pray for our leaders, right? We got to pray for revival. There's a lot of things we can't control. Uh, we can't control things. Uh, Man, I, I, I love my peers in northwest Arkansas. They got their own problems they're dealing with over there, okay? And I was on a conference call yesterday with some pastors out there. And so we can't control, but we can do some things here in northeast Arkansas. And I just want to encourage you this, and I'll, I'll be the first to confess, uh, I don't like masks. Anybody out there? Okay. I mean, there's doctors here. Bill Panic's the doctor for 40 years, and he wore a mask all the time. I don't like, I don't like them. And I'm not trying to be the redneck, rebellious person or whatever, but, you know, uh, but here's what I've learned from this. Folks, if you want to help our small businesses in town, and I know you do, we need to be responsible citizens. We need to respect them. We need to help them, or they're going to show up on a list somewhere. And so I just want to encourage you. I want to shepherd you in this, and I want you to know as a pastor, hey, I'm going to do a better job, and I don't understand how everything works, and we all got our opinions of this, but, hey, you know what? There's people's livelihoods at stake. And we know the enemy, he seeks to devour and kill and destroy. And I even asked her, I said, well, what about the church? She said, well, aren't you, someone comes to church and it is, uh, and we go through the questions and we ask, did they have sanitizers? Yes. Uh, did you wear a face mask? And she said, the people say yes. And face masks were used in the church. She said, we know pretty well and believe that probably 99% sure that there's no transmission occurred at the church. That probably occurred somewhere else. They just happened to be there. And here's what the person shared with They said, Archie, said, Pastor, you're going to have people, they don't know they have it. They're asymptomatic. They're going to show up at church. They, they just don't know. And they're going to have it. And said, you need to help with that. So I just want to encourage us, okay, in the community, okay. Uh, I'm not going to say that you got to wear it in your car when you're driving down the road. But I just want to encourage you. I'm going to do better. I want to try to lead out in this. And uh, uh, I'm going to fight for our small businesses and I'm going to share my thoughts and opinions, probably not reflected of Central. I'm going to speak on behalf of Archie Mason when I have an opportunity to do that this week. But I just want to encourage you, be responsible, be respectful of others, help those uh, out in the community because the health department is trying to do their job, but they are accumulating a database where everybody's been, and it's cumulative. So if we're in this for 10 months, I'm sure there are going to be folks who show up here, don't know it, could be me or you. We get tested, we got it, we list Central Baptist Church down, that's a growing number. Okay, 
I just think that was not accurately reported on Friday. It came across as an outbreak. And let me say one more time. There's no outbreak. We've not been notified by the health department, and we were not notified by any individual, say they tested positive here uh, at Central. Okay? That's enough said on that. Now, I know some of you are watching just because you want to know what I was going to say. So let me share this with you. I want you to know that, man, Jesus loves us, loves people, died on the cross for our sins that we might have life. Man, he says we can have life, have abundantly. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, I, I don't want to listen to your message, preach. I'm about to zone off because I just want to write an article. I just want to sit in my penguin pajamas and my uh, bunny rabbit shoes. I'm about to fire off something on Facebook and tell you how much I hate you and all this stuff. Well, just do me a favor. Stay with us for about 30 more minutes. This is a great passage of Scripture. It is a passage that could change your life for eternity. All right? Hey, would you stand with me for the public reading of Scripture this morning, starting out in verse 21. And although... This is Paul, Riley Church of Colossae. And although you were formerly alienated, hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. Now rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to stewardship from God bestowed on me for your behalf, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man, teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. I want to tell you folks, man, what a great passage of scripture. For us as believers, we're going to talk about how he rescues us, how he's rebuilding us. For those who hear, those watching and not a follower of Christ, I, you're going to, I believe the Lord's going to speak very clearly. No matter where you've been, what you've done, he loves you, he cares for you, he will forgive you if you will call upon him today. Okay, let's pray. Father, I say thank you. Lord, I know I'm praying, I got my eyes open, I'm looking out the back door, sun shining. Thank you for a beautiful day, Lord that you have given us. It's a day you have made, you've created. We rejoice in it. Uh, Lord, nothing takes you by surprise. Uh, you know all things. Uh, Lord, give us understanding. Holy Spirit, give us illumination of the passage. Uh, for believers, I pray, renewing and restoring. Just a, uh, Lord, just a, a new realization of what you have done in our lives, Lord, and for salvation and forgiveness and reconciliation. But Lord, for someone who's not born again, I pray today would be the day of salvation. So save somebody today. It's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen, amen. Please be seated if you would. Thanks for standing for the uh, public reading of Scripture. So uh, I want to show a picture. I've showed this before. It's probably back sometime in May. We were all online then, so some of you may have saw it, some of you may not. This is a, mine and Angie's, or it's really Angie's kitchen table. And uh, it can seat 10. We can put 10 around it because we got the grandkids stuff and, and all that. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit of story about this. This is a Cypress table. Uh, this was created and made from a Cypress tree that was discovered uh, in the White River outside of Augusta. Uh, it's called a sunken cypress. We, it's probably over 100 years old, maybe a couple hundred old cypress tree that fell in the river, waterlogged, sunk, got down. It was found by divers. Now, if you're like me, you're like, what's a diver doing looking for a tree in the bottom of the White River? You know, It's found by divers. It was uh, brought up to the surface, and they took it. There are people who do this, by the way. They took it, put it in a factory, a warehouse, and began a drying process, I think, which took months or a couple years, uh, then sawed it in a plank, and then redid it. Now, I, okay, so again, I'm very visual in this, so you can pick, I, I grew up on a white river, and uh, snakes, alligator, gar, it's just the way it is, okay? Great fishing and fun stuff, used to ski in a white river, but uh, this thing's down in the mud and the dirt. Hey, there's been turtles crawling on it, slimy, got algae growing on it, and all that kind of stuff. Now, but, but what we have in our kitchen table is when our grandkids eat here, if Liam's sitting here, or we got the twins, Miles are still, but if Liam's sitting there and he spills something on the table, you know how kids are, he puts it on the table, he'll reach over and grab it and stick it in his mouth. Now, you're thinking, man, that's wild, because if you look at the, think about the nastiness of it before and being in the river, that's who we were. 
Okay? That's who we were. We were in the darkness. We, the Bible says that we walked according to the prince of the power of the air. We were dead in our iniquities and sins. I mean, it's the idea of, of the, the, just the evil and that kind of stuff. But what the Lord did as a believer is that he saved us. He rescued us. Okay? He redeemed us. He reconciled us. And then he repurposed us. He rebuilt us. He restored us. I mean, this was on the bottom of the river for years. And even yesterday, I sat right here in this chair plugging my laptop into the wall, just reviewing. Well, I spent most of the time sitting there on the phone with the health department, really, and, and trying to gain information. But right there, serving a purpose, a tool in the church, you see, that's, that's what the Lord does in us. He takes us, regardless of where we've been, and He uh, rebuilds us. And it's a continual process. And that's what this passage is about today. Hey, let's kind of jump in there in verse 21. He says this, and although you, now he's speaking to those who are believers. So anyone who's a believer who's born again, you can take your finger and you can point it at yourself. And that you is you. It's me. It's us. That's what the Lord is referring to here. He says, and although you were formerly alienated, which means to be estranged. It means to be cut off. It means to be separated. Now, if I were you and I was sitting out there where you're sitting and the pastor's up here saying that stuff, I know how my mind works. As a believer, I'd probably go, yeah, that's right. But it maybe a young believer or maybe someone who's not a believer, you know, you may be thinking, well, let me think through that, you know. And you, it may even come across your mind to say, well, you know, even though I wasn't a believer, I was close to Jesus. No, you weren't. Not according to this past. No, you weren't. You know, hey, look, I was an unbeliever for 25 years of life. I grew up in a Baptist church. I was in church like every Sunday except when I was in college, uh, you know. And when I came home, I, had, I went to church. And uh, you said, well, he's close to the Lord. No, I wasn't. I was estranged. I was separated. I was cut off. There was a chasm between him and I. Did he know me? Yes. Did he love me? Yes. But I was not close to him. That's the idea. You were alienated. That's who we used to be. Uh, and hostile in mind. Hostile is a word that can translate hatred. Uh, it means, well, let me just read a quote. Be better there. Here's a quote I wrote down. Unbelievers are not only alienated from God because of condition, okay, which is sin, all right, but also hateful of God by attitude. They resent his holy standards. So I did my undergrad at Arkansas Tech University, Redneck Tech. That's what we called it. Had a great ag program, but it's kind of a country school. And uh, I was in a fraternity. Okay, I wasn't born again. Wasn't so I was in a fraternity. And I had some football player friends that were part of that fraternity. And, man, we loved football games. It was crazy good, you know, for college. We just loved football, just like I love A-State football. And uh, just good stuff, tailgating and, and all that. But we played one team, University of Conway. Oh, hatred for them. It was not fun. I mean, if I can remember right, this is mid-'80s, late-'80s, so y'all know my age, basically. But we, there would kind of be stuff circulating through the fraternities like, Okay, realize whatever you do, whatever the game was, if the game was in Conway, it'd always be like, do not go to Conway this week before the game and do not go on their campus. Do not go paint their bear that stood, you know, in the square. And when you tell a college fraternity lost guy, don't go paint their bear, what do you think he's going to do? I mean, we have people go to jail. Here people got arrested because of that. And then it would be the same thing, but when we would have a home game, UCA would come. I lived in an apartment right across from the football field, and you knew any time before that game on Saturday that something could happen that week. And sure enough, if I remember right there, times I woke up like UCA, they attacked our field. I mean, that, they painted stuff on our field. They did stuff, and I don't think they got arrested and get caught. I mean, it'd be fist fight breakout at games. It was just incredible hostility. Now, that's just a smidgen of what it means when it says we were hostile in mind. We had, you may say, no, I wouldn't. I didn't hate God. Yes, you did. You said, no, I was close to God. No, you weren't. I didn't hate him. Yeah, you did. Well, no, I, I just didn't like maybe something he said. Hostile in mind. Uh, engaged in evil deeds. If you got a Bible, you can flip over the Romans. I think they got this passage maybe uh, there in the back and they'll throw on the screen. Let me read in verse 19. It says, uh, because that which is known about God, this Romans 1, 19, that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. You know, I've shared this many times. As we travel around the world, when you go into a country where a person is not sure exactly where their meal is coming from tomorrow, uh, they know that uh, it doesn't come from the grocery store. They know there's somebody out there that is farming, producing that, or somebody's out there fishing, catching fish, and maybe uh, they're in a the marketplace. But 
But I've never met an atheist in a third world country. I have never met that before. Because what happens, most people who live in a culture where it's day-to-day uh, living and day-to-day for uh, production of food, they know, they, they go outside and creation and look around, they know that there is a God in heaven. They just do not know how to reach him. And when you go and begin to share the gospel message, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, I mean, it's exciting because they're like, yeah, I mean, they get it. Well, this is what the Bible says, man, it's without excuse. He's without excuse because of creation, general revelation, you can't get saved through that. But he says he makes it evident within them that there is a God. Now, this special revelation comes through Christ that we see in the New Testament, the gospel, and, and man, people coming to the Lord, hearing the gospel, how that works, that's that. But he says, man, it's not an excuse. And if you go on down, it says that they denied the creator, began to worship creation. It says God gave them over. Some translations say a reprobate mind. God gave them over. Where women uh, degrading in their passions uh, started to uh, desire one another, men desire one another. I mean, it takes a list. And so some people say, well, hey, pastor, what that means, there's degrees of sin. No, not really. Not doctrinally. Sin is sin. Now, there are different degrees of manifestation of sin. Uh, for me, drunkenness and stuff like that in my life. But I'm still a sinner. You see, the Bible says that we're alienated. We were hostile. We were engaged in evil deeds. You may say, well, I wouldn't engage in evil deeds when I was lost. Well, you were prideful. That's pretty evil. You know, it's still a box. We're all in sin. You say, well, wow. I, yeah, okay. That's when, so that's what he says. He says he rescues us. This is who we once were, okay? And so that's when I say, don't ever get over getting saved, being saved. Uh, don't ever, even if you were saved at six years of age, it ought to just be fresh and new like every day. You know, you say, man, at six, Archie, I knew I was a sinner in need of a Savior. I say, praise God, hallelujah. Just let that roll over you, the grace of the Lord. You and I do not deserve salvation. We do not deserve forgiveness of sin. We can't earn it. We can't merit it. We can't buy it. We can't be good enough for it. Man, it's by the grace of the Lord. So he says, this is who you once were. And he says this next. He says, uh, and yet... He has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. Reconciliation means to change or exchange. It means totality, okay? So what it is, he's reconciled you in his fleshly body through death. Now, that's the idea of a redemption and purchasing us and how he died on the cross for us. But don't run past this through his fleshly body through death. In fact, if you got your Bible, look up in verse 20. This is where Pastor Don was a couple weeks ago. It says, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. What we see in this passage is blood, cross, and uh, we see death. Whenever you read in the New Testament about the blood of the Lord Jesus, we know we sing about the blood of Jesus, the fountain flowing, uh, Emmanuel's veins. We talk about the blood, the cleansing. We know Hebrews tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. But sometimes we miss the context of that. Whenever you you hear and read about the blood of Christ and his death, it's the idea of violence. Really, the idea of blood is violent death. Is what, in the context of it, that's kind of the idea of it. So, for example, we know this, that the trial of the Lord Jesus was uh, held at night, which was unlawful to do, was held at night, that he goes before Pilate. We know Pilate says he finds nothing wrong with him anyway. They say, condemn him, let Barabbas go. And we know, too, that that Jesus was sent to be flogged. Now, the Roman soldiers knew how to whip somebody to almost to the point of death. In fact, the way I understand history, that if a Roman soldier was flogging someone before they go to the cross to be crucified and kind of actually killed them or accidentally killed them, they'd be in trouble. So they, they knew how to take that cat of nine tails with bone and metal and to whip somebody with great torture and pain almost to the brink of death. Uh, we know that the Bible tells us the visage of Jesus, his appearance. He was unrecognizable, basically, when he goes to the cross. They plucked his beard from his face. So you can imagine the crown of thorns pushed upon his head, the swollen face because he'd been beaten, he'd been whipped. Uh, some uh, scholars uh, and biblical historians believe that it was almost his, his organs were contained, but close to not being contained. That's, that's how bad it was. And it was for the point of as much torture as possible. Then he carries his cross, his cross beam to Calvary, and they nail him up. Now, we know that part of the suffering of the cross was suffocation, that you would have to get up on your feet, which were nailed together, to breathe, and then you come back down. And you get back up to breathe and come back down. So when you ask the question, yeah, I remember reading where they broke the legs of the people around him. Why did they break their legs? So they'd suffocate. They broke their legs so they couldn't stand up, and they'd just finally breathe out. Well, Jesus, 
his legs were not broken. When they came to him, they said he's already dead. They poked a spear in the side, and the Bible says that the blood and the water came out. He's already dead. Well, what happened? Here's what happened. Jesus bled out on the cross. This is what happened. Really. I mean, I, I know you might say you're 100% sure, about 99.5% sure of that. It's my personal theological that he bled out on the cross. Because in the Old Testament, when they cut the throat of an animal, he said, well, the animal just fell up, poof, went dead. No, he bled out. That's how he died. I know it's violence. That's, that's like, oh, that's gross. That's, that's the point. His blood, his death. And he says, through his fleshly body, okay, and death, okay, that's how did he bled out for you and I. And that's what he said, it's finished. That's just good. We don't deserve that. We can't earn that. That's what he did because he was uh, not only our sacrifice, he was our substitute. He took our place. Yes, he was our atonement. He redeemed us through his blood, his death, his resurrection, the gospel. He redeemed us. He purchased us uh, with his blood. Now, he says, in order to present you before him holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. Now, I know we're spending some time here, but I want you to think about this. That word holy is the idea of separated to God. This is who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're separated to him. We're, we're holy. Uh, blameless, uh, which is the uh, idea without blemish. No blemishes upon us. Beyond reproach is the idea that that Satan, the accuser, he may accuse us. He may say, oh, yeah, Jesus. Hey, you're preacher boy down there in Jonesboro, aren't you? Oh, yeah, he, he was a drunk. And Jesus may say, yeah, that's exactly right. But now he's holy. But now he's without blemish. And guess what, Satan? Now he's beyond reproach. Now, Friday night, did I get mad? Yes, I did. Did I think in my mind, this is not right? Yes. Did I get in the flesh? Yes. Did I think it was unfair treatment? Yes. Did I start contemplating in my flesh what I thought I needed to do? Yes. Did I have plenty of male believers around me that were texting me? Redneck male believers. <laughs> they were texting me going, hey, look, and it's a friend of mine, and he was mad too for us. He said, look, he said, you've been given a platform. You've been given a place of influence. You need to go for the throat. You need to make sure this never happens to anybody else again. I'm like, let's, and I knew, now look, I was mad, but I knew that uh, I needed to sleep Friday night. I needed to get more information, you know, and was it still even Saturday morning like, we got a church full of lawyers. I'm sure we can put something together. Did those things come through my mind? Yes. Were they right? No. Was it fleshly? Yeah, I think so. I do now. Did it please the Lord that I'd get redneck in the flesh? And I don't think so. You say, well, that was holy righteous anger. No, I was just mad. Okay. I was mad that nobody in our community contacted us before. I thought we deserved better than that. See, you can tell I'm still kind of mm, wants to rise back up. Does that make the Lord happy? No. But here's what I know. I'm still holy before him. I'm still without blemish. And I'm still beyond reproach. Can Satan take my attitude Friday night and accuse me before the Lord? Yes, he can. But the Lord's like, Look at these nails, God. That's my boy. Now, hey, yeah, that redneck still in the flesh, okay? But I shed my blood at Calvary, Satan. You know your end, and he knows his future. And he's beyond reproach. And he's that's who we are in Christ, folks. Man, that's where somebody online ought to be typing it. Amen, hallelujah, praise God. I mean, really. I mean, that ought to get you pumped up and excited. That ought to make you realize that, hey, look, is it crazy around the world? Yeah, yeah, but greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. Man, don't get your heads down. Don't get discouraged. Don't get depressed. Man, we serve a risen Savior. Hey, he's, he knows it. We don't fight for victory. We fight from it, okay? I want to encourage you with that. Man, that's why this passage is, is so good. And for someone, if you're here today and you're an unbeliever, I mean, this is a, the, the hope, the promise, the, the good stuff. And not the hope like wishful thinking, but based upon the finished work of Christ upon the cross. 
I mean, this is what he has for us. Now, he also says this, though, in the next verse. He says, if, now you got to hear this, if indeed you continue in the faith firmly established, okay, not move away from the hope of the gospel. Now, you also need to understand that, yes, we believe in the Bible Belt. Coming to faith in Christ is not like praying a prayer, signing a card, shaking the preacher's hand, and look, I'm in, and I'm not ever coming back to church. It's not that, okay? It's about a true relationship with Jesus. Uh, and, and as the believers, we persevere. We follow Him. Uh, that's who we are. That's an evidence of uh, being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just persevering. Can we get in the flesh? Can we get mad? Yes. Can we make bad decisions, make mistakes? Yes. But as a believer, this is not a, a, a text that's like, will you lose your salvation? No, we don't lose our salvation. But we also know that there are those. I was one of those. I prayed a prayer. I walked an aisle. I went through the baptistry. I was, <laughs> I was not close to the Lord. I was not like not engaging in evil deeds. I'm not like, well, I was like on the last step before going through the pearly gate. And by the way, there are pearly gates in heaven. You hear all those jokes, but there are. You can go read the end of Revelation. But it wasn't like I was on the last step. No, I prayed a prayer. It was not sincere. It was not in faith. It was not in repentance. And so I want to encourage you, if you're here, hey, honestly, you need to realize that kitchen table that we now eat on and my grandkids will reach and grab food off and stick in their mouth. It once was a sunken, smelly, cypress tree with water and turtles, fish, alligator, gar, all kinds of stuff crawling around on it for years. But it got raised to the top, and it got rebuilt for the purpose that God had for it. And that's what he does for us today. So you may say, I'm not good enough. You're exactly right. You're not good enough. You say, well, I need to do something. You can't do anything. He's already done it. You say, well, can I earn my way? Nope. You can't do that. What you do is you come to him in faith and repentance. Lord, I turn from my sin. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Lord Jesus, save me. And the Bible says, you call upon him, he'll save you. So he he rescues us. But here's next what we see is that he rebuilds us, okay? He repurposes us for his purposes. And, And so Paul, when he's writing there, he talks about this in 24. He says, my suffering for your sake. He's talking about being the apostle and what he's gone through. And Man, the missionary journeys, you know, and stuff, the planning of churches and all that. He says, the suffering for your sake and the flesh. He said, filling up what's lacking in Christ's affliction. So, and it's talking about suffering and persecution and how even that's drawn him closer to the Lord and how he suffered for the churches that he's planted. And verse 25, he said, of the church I was made a minister according to stewardship. Now, what I want to do, Paul... Uh, writing to the church, talking about what's going on in his own life and how he's a, an apostle, a messenger of God, and uh, a pastor, and a church planner, and all this stuff. You know, all that he's doing uh, in that. But it's the idea of serving the body, okay? So I want to take that. He has a specific calling to what God has called him to do. But all of us have a calling to serve the body. As a believer in the Lord Jesus, all of us have a calling to serve. Now, we look around, I know, when I was speaking again, health department, very nice. Very, I mean, I cannot believe on a Saturday, they, you know, we're back and forth contacting. And so I cannot, I just want to say, uh, man, thank you and good job uh, and, and all that. The individual asked me, well, what's the size of the auditorium? Because I told them we're doing practicing social distancing. We have limited capacity. She said, man, doing a good job on that. She said, man, that's a big church uh, and that kind of stuff. And I said, yeah. And she, she was a believer. And so, but here also, you need to realize we talk about the church is not the building, it's believers. Okay? It's those who are uh, repentant, put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have here in this passage kind of general application is that we, God has rescued us and he is rebuilding us and we have a purpose of serving in the body. Now, here's my question. How can we as believers, how can we serve? Now, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's different right now uh, than pre-COVID. And, and what took place. But you know, you can start one another. You can pray for one another. You can call each other. I mean, some of you are like me. Uh, I didn't do that many meetings online. I am like a Zoom professional right now, okay? Uh, I can change my background screen when I'm on a call uh, or, you know, a video call. I don't know if y'all know that or not. So I'm always at the beach, by the way, and, and stuff going on. And so, you know, you can, you can contact people, you can talk with, but you can serve in that way. You can pray for people. You encourage people. You know there are folks here and folks online, they need encouragement. I mean, they need encouragement. They need strengthening. They need a kind word uh, said to them. That's just a way uh, that we can serve. We can, yeah, I know we can't be doing the holy kissing, holy hugging thing uh, necessarily right now uh, outside your family unit or whatever. So, but, you know, we can, man, you can love on people in that way. But also, let me share with you this. I and mean, you can... You can love your enemies. Hey, do I stand in a place of criticism? Yes. Uh, 
You know, there's a lot of people, again, I just go back. They can sit in their pajamas and just pop off anything they want to. And nobody, because I just want to encourage you. If that's happening in your life, don't let that stuff bother you. You need to love people. Amen? Come on. You need to love them. You may say, oh, I'm going to let them know how I feel. I probably don't need to do that necessarily. You just need love folks, man. Love them. The Bible tells us love our enemies. Uh, pray for those who persecute us, right? Come on. Uh, we're just in a culture of that time. You need to love people. Uh, love your community. Love people that you don't agree with. Uh, love people that you do agree with. That do good uh, for your neighbors. I mean, it's a, I go back to, man, our businesses and stuff. Man, respect them. Love them. Uh, encourage them. I mean, my heart breaks. I mean, I'm in a business. I'm in business last Thursday. And the owner says, hey, Brother Archie, pray for us. This, tomorrow's our last day. I mean, man, and it's like, I don't know what we're going to do, but I'm going to trust the Lord. Uh, that's where we live. And so we love our community. Let me tell you what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to love on our police force here in July. Uh, we're going to love on our police wives. Now, I don't know if you know this. Uh, I cannot imagine being a police person's wife or husband. Let me say that right now. If a police woman, police man, I want to be correct in that. So we're going to serve. Uh, the wives, particularly, we're going to uh, fix a meal. Uh, we're going to cook for them. We're going to encourage them. Uh, I think there's a, a lady speaker coming to speak to those wives, uh, you know, and then we're going to cook for all the shifts of the police department. We want to let them know. I told Angie one day, I was watching stuff on the news. I said, I couldn't do that. She said, what do you mean? I said, somebody in my face calling me every name in the book and me just standing there looking at them. I said, I, I just don't know how I could handle that. That's just different to me. I said, I can't Im imagine that job. And I know, I'm saying this, there are folks out there going, we're fixing to kill you on Facebook. We'll just come on, because this is what we're going to do in our community. We're going to love our policemen and police women. We're going to support them. Hey, you know what? We're going to love folks that don't love us. We're going to love folks that criticize us. Man, we're going to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ with people. I mean, that's who we are as a church. You know, we live in a culture. I just want to encourage you. It doesn't make any difference what you do these days. It does not make any difference. Somebody is going to say something. Hey, man, love God. Love others. Put the Lord first. Do your best at following Him. Let all this other stuff just roll off of you, okay? Because the enemy is seeking to divide our source. So, how can we serve? Well, that's just one way we want to serve our community. And there will be other ways, other things that come up. Uh, in the future. So we're going to do that as a church. But also, when he rebuilds us, it's for the purpose of proclamation. Now, Paul says, I was made a, a proclaimer of the gospel. He said, for this reason, I want to present all men uh, to Christ. You know, we see that at the end. And so it's proclamation. You realize you have such a great opportunity as a follower of Lord Jesus Christ. You, look, there are people questioning, uh, what's going on in the world? Well, it's crazy. Uh, uh, you know, and people say, what, what are we going to do? We're going to keep living. We're going to keep loving Jesus, and we know he loves us. But what do you mean? If Jesus loved us, why would, he, why would he let all this happen if he truly loved us? The greatest act of love was demonstrated, and he went to the cross. When people say that question to you, I can't believe Jesus is going to allow this to happen. The greatest act of love was when he went to the cross and bled out for you and me on that cross. That's the greatest act of love right there. Uh, there, there's nothing else he has to demonstrate how much he loves us, greatest act. Bring it back to Jesus. Be a proclaimer of the gospel. Can we do things to help our community and nation? I, I guess we can. If you call them social things and stuff, I'm, I'm sure we can. The greatest thing we do is, man, love Jesus, love others, share Jesus, be proclaimers. That's just general categories here of when he, he rebuilds us, he repurposes, he retools us for serving, Okay. And our serving's different based upon our abilities and our gifts and our specific calling. It's different, but it's still serving. And it's for the proclamation of the gospel. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're at the end. As I was speaking with the, the individual in the health department, and they were asking about our practices, and she said, man, you're doing a really good job and stuff. I said, you know, I said, we're Baptist Church. I said, we, uh, we have always had a walk-down invitation. I said, that's pre-COVID. I said, this is a weird deal. I said, you know, I don't like it. And... I said, but I don't really know how to, what to do with it, and I want to be respectful of others. And so you need to know that I'm going to be here after the service is over with, so I got my mask. Uh, I was telling her, I said, you know, we still have an invitation. We just kind of do it in the foyer. 
And she said, well, that's pretty cool. And, and this person was a believer. She said, that's pretty cool. I said, we do it and we have pastors out there. But uh, we're going to even do it a little bit of a different way today. We have a room. Uh, it's not a room. It's kind of a, an open area, but it's called Next Steps. How many of y'all miss coffee at Central? Anybody miss coffee? Come on, let's give a testimony here. This is where you can, some of y'all, okay, some of you are lying. So anyway, but we don't have coffee. I told her, I said, we don't have coffee. I hate it. It's killing me, you know, and, and uh, so we're not on coffee. But that Next Steps is right down past the coffee area. If you have a question or you want a pastor to pray with you, they'll have a mask on. They'll be there. Uh, you have something you want to speak with them confidentially about. You got something going on in your life. You might say, man, I, Archie, I'm a believer. I haven't been baptized by immersion. And, you know, you didn't even preach on that, but that's the Holy Spirit spoke to me today. And uh, that's, the, that's the next step. That's the next step. You may say, I need to recommit my life to Christ. I got some stuff. I'm a believer, but I got some stuff. I, that's the next step. I encourage you to do that. Just get that right with the Lord, okay? And so it's there. And then also, too, for all those that are online, you're participating. Stay engaged with that pastor you're talking with. Uh, you can also text. 1-870-935-1951. Text READY to that number. And I may throw that up on the screen here in just a moment. But, uh, and there'll be someone contact you. But hey, so we want to help you. We want to walk with you. I, I know there are questions. I know there are burdens. I know there are hurts. I know there are pains. I know there are things you don't understand. And, but I know Jesus has an answer. Okay? And I know He loves you. And He will walk with you through this. You say, aren't you worried about the future? Nah. I'm not worried about the future. Now, I don't know what's coming tomorrow. I do understand that when Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow, day has enough trouble of its own, I, I really get that, you know. Now, do we plan? Yes, but, but I know he's, he guides us. It's all good. But I also know that here, and I know some participating online, you're not a follower of Jesus. Maybe you grew up in a church. Maybe you're a member, but you're not born again. There's no specific prayer in Scripture to pray. Mine was very simple. Oh, God, save me. So the attitude in my heart, not the exact wording of my prayer, the attitude in my heart was repentance. The attitude in my heart was faith. The attitude in my heart was belief. I'm one of those guys that there's never a process. There are things that lead up to salvation, but it's not like a, you could say process like God was drawing me. Mine was everything hit at one time. It went, pow, I got it. Oh, God, save me. Instantaneous for me. Now, maybe not for you, what's for me? That's my prayer. For you, it may be faith, sincerity. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. You're the Savior. You're right. I'm wrong. Lord Jesus, forgive me. I repent. Save me, Lord Jesus. The Bible is very specific. If you call upon the Lord, He'll save you. That means master, ruler, owner, repentance, faith, wrapped up in one. So my prayer has been somebody be saved today. I knew this broadcast online would be watched a lot and I said oh Lord if you would just take this time in the life of Central and maybe someone who's been a critic of Central for years and hated me as a pastor if you would take this moment in history this weekend and allow them to stay tuned to save them is worth everything. You see, He loves us. He cares for us. He'll save you today. I don't care where you've been, what you've done. He'll save you today. Call upon Him. Let's pray. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus because there's no other name. And Lord, thank you. You're good. You're gracious. You're mighty. You're holy. Lord, I know there are believers here, those who are engaging online. There may be some decisions, commitments. Lord, I pray those here online will let that pastor know, chat with them, communicate with them. Hey, here's what's going on in life. For others that are here, maybe to just go to that next step for him and just tell the pastor there, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what the Lord's done in my life. Pray no one to be ashamed of you today. But Lord, I also know there are those who need to be saved. Lord, I pray they'll call upon you right now. Very simple prayer, sincerity and faith, repentance, turning from sin, turning to you, believing in you, that you died on the cross and took our place, that you are the king of glory. Lord, I pray you would save somebody today. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in your name, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey, before you're gone, before you're dismissed, again, those online, hey, stay connected. Talk to that pastor. We want to help you any way we can. Those that are here, next steps, right down there to the left. Hey, we love you guys. We appreciate you. God is good. He's on the throne. Don't get discouraged. Don't get depressed. Keep your head up, and uh, he's going to show you the way. He'll give you wisdom sermon. Hey, hope you have a great week.